welcome to the Colonial Garden. We are here on the Duke of Gloucester Street in Colonial Williamsburg, across from the Bruton Parish Church. I am here with our guest, Michael Twitty, culinary historian, and Robert Watson, historic interpreter. And we are here to tell you about a project we are working on. It's called the Sankofa Heritage Garden. And uh, Michael has been kind enough to come and help us set it up, uh, figure out the plant list, plant some of it, and Robert has been a, a great help in helping maintain the garden. So first off, y'all probably want to know what Sankofa is all about. So, so you want to tell us? Thank you, thank you, Robert. Um, <laughs> Sankofa is a word from the tree language of Ghana, and the tree speakers are the Akan peoples, you may know the Ashanti and the Fanti and other ethnic groups that live in Ghana. And the word Sankofa is a philosophical term. And it means that it is no sin to go back to your past to retrieve something that you need to move into the future. So in other words, acknowledging our history, our identities, our truths, our ancestral wisdom as a means of healing and renewal before you make your next steps. That's what Sankofa means. So you'll notice a difference in this garden. Um, it's not as extremely apparent now as it will be later on in the season. So the type of garden that I normally tend all the time is something you would see in the colonial town. And it's uh, very English in nature. So very geometric, uh, rows lined out, everything hoed beautifully watered monocultural <laughs> and monocultural thank you yes so the ground is left uncovered because there's plenty of labor which is usually in our circumstance in a garden such as this the enslaved people so they're here they're toiling they're weeding keeping the ground open and clear because it is not like well like england it's just not as hot here as it would be in africa so the idea is to keep it very tidy and neat, whereas uh, all the plants have their place. So in the Sankofa garden. Well, this is sort of a bridge between two worlds because, yeah, there are lines here, but there are also hills and mounds. And even though it doesn't look like it yet, all of this will be filled in with plants. So yes, there are lines, but those lines denote plants that will go well with other plants, companion planting. So here you have more plants densely planted so that you have less watering to do, so that you have less room for weeds to do encroachment. And some of the weeds that we're taking out today are kind of like, eh, you don't really, you wouldn't really use them for anything in particular. But back then, purslane, lamb's quarters, goosefoot, um, dandelion, all would have had their medicinal and culinary uses. So those weeds wouldn't just be thrown out. Uh, they would be used as pot herbs, what we call pot herbs. In other words, greens that grow naturally, that you eat seasonally, and then other times you discard. That's one element. The next, so you have here, for example, um, the sorghum and pigeon peas planted together. Now, long before enslaved Africans and Africans arrived in the New World, much like indigenous Native Americans, they're growing things in mounds with the grass, which is the elevator, the peas around it, um, which, are, which support themselves on that grass, and then melons between them. So, Eve, where, where are Agusi melons? Uh, Agusi is right here. Right there? Right there, and there's also one back here, and I've hidden one someplace else. I don't... Oh, up there. Right. So those melons will grow in, cover the spaces that are empty. The peas will grow up heavily, and they will give nutrients to the soil. Now, here's the bottom line. I don't want to fool anybody into thinking that before a certain time period, European, African, or Native had a, bio, had, a had a lab where they did all the, all the science behind this. That's not how this works. This is called centuries and millennia of watching and talking and yeah. wisdom. These are amateur botanists, and that does not mean that they are primitive botanists. It means that they sometimes knew more about how the soil and the seasons worked than people in our own time, civilians in our own time, people who are not working in lab. They're observing. They're observing. Yeah. And they're observing because their life depends on it. Yeah. Because if your crops fail, you don't eat. Yeah. 
So that's how that goes. So we want to make sure that people understand that those, that those sweet potato mounds are going to come in with the leaves, but also people are eating those leaves, and things will still be planted as this garden grows into the fall. Now, of course, at some point, just about every one of these plants is going to die off because of the climate. That's one thing that you would not have in West Africa. What you would have, though, is wet and dry seasons. Those will affect what can grow when. So the wet season is probably when these hills are raised up, the seeds are planted, right. and then the viney plants cover the soil because right. the dry season is coming. That's right. it. That's it. That's it. And a great example over here by Robert is uh, we have okra growing, and then right behind that are cow peas. We have, uh, we have peas from Senegal. We also have uh, Geechee peas that are going to climb on that okra. So here we have two plants that support each other and uh, they take up less space. So a lot of food in a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. And the peanuts also will provide um, nutrients. So long before, long before we had, you know, um, an official policy of scientific farming in this country, there were these traditional methods. People knew if I plant peas or peanuts this year, I'll plant something that's like tall the next year. That's how they reckon it, tall and short and medium. We know it as these are nitrogen fixers. So what they do is restore nutrients and vitality to the soil so that things like, like sorghum and corn and millet um, that grow tall, sugarcane even in some places, yeah. will be able to be more nourished and won't do as much damage to the soil. And so you just kind of shift cultivation as you go through as well. Yeah. So um, as we're as we're going along, if you have questions for us or something you'd like to know what it is in the garden, uh, please chime in. We have someone who will ask those questions, and we can hopefully answer them for you. Have a nice dialogue. Yes. So uh, lots of tomatoes. So the tomato is important in the African diaspora diet. And uh, in our garden, so speaking of the colonials, a tomato is being eaten, but very, very little bit. Yes. And even at one time thought to be poisonous. Yes. And would, you would find them in a flower pot in the garden as an oddity. So I could also point out our eggplant. That's the same way. That is something that is not in the English diet. Uh, we have the little white uh, eggplant. Um, which in Virginia at that time is called guinea squash. Yes. So that tells you exactly yeah. what they reckoned it as and where they thought it came from and who is really eating that plant. Yeah. Yes. So this angle, you know, this colonist is not eating that. He has enough flower pot and it's an unusual flower and it's an unusual looking vegetable to him. So it's much like a peanut. I've heard it, uh, possibly that someone in Philadelphia as an oddity would have grown a peanut plant in a garden in a flower pot because it wasn't wasn't something he, it was in his food ways. Right. But at the same time, we have peanuts in the archaeological record of Richneck and other Virginia plantations in Maryland and in North Carolina and of course in South Carolina. So we know the enslaved people are growing this and eventually it makes its way into Jefferson's garden yes. in Monticello. But again, it's it's like something special and odd. And, oh, look what I have, mm. as opposed to a curiosity, as yeah. opposed to just like, I wanna, I'm want i going to eat this tomorrow. Yeah. That doesn't happen until probably for Americans after the Civil War. And that's only because you have people coming from the southeastern seaboard who have been exposed to peanuts and peanut eating who are going north. And it becomes America's favorite snack food at that point. But it just goes to show you how long it takes foods that are staples to others to become staples in other cultures and, and backgrounds. Yeah. Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about, we've touched a little bit on what this garden yeah, represented. Yeah, to, uh, to be in a garden like this, to be present, someone like me, uh, African-American, descendant of free and enslaved people, I think of Ben, I think of Ferguson, I think of Lancaster, men that we know were gardeners in this town of Williamsburg who 
work for their masters, but use those same skills that they did in their master's gardens, and they work for themselves. So here I am, after all that time from the past to now, still in the same place, on the same dirt, bringing that history to life. I'm replanting some sweet potatoes. So I'm digging the hole out, gonna put some water in here, and gonna set that plant down a little bit deeper so it can have a pretty good start to grow. Then I make a little ring around it, just like that. So when we water tomorrow, that nice little ring will hold all that water in and give that plant what it needs. So uh, another thing to consider are all the different sorts of garden uh, gardens of free black and enslaved individuals. Yes. Yes. So some were tended only very, very little. Uh, there's a really great article called Little Spots Allowed Them. And literally the land that was not very uh, desirable was given to the enslaved individuals to grow a garden. And little, a little patch here, a little patch there, and they would tend them when they could if they had time. So maybe by moonlight at night right. or on a, on a day off. So also how the uh, task system, uh, how the enslaved are worked, do they... Do, are they task oriented where they when they finish up something they have some free time and they would work their plots or is it a gang system and you're working pretty much all day long and there's not a whole lot of time to be tending your garden so it's not going to be unusual for a garden such as this to have some weeds and this is not lack of care this is not care carelessness or you know, you don't want to work out in your garden. This is your life. This is your extra food. Uh, this is what you are growing for yourself. Your master has given, given you food, but this is what you have chosen, hopefully. And um, you're not going to get to it to weed it as often as other your other gardens. And when it's also broken down according to uh, gender and age. So, for example, little kids are going to work very early. And they're going to be taught the skills that they need to maintain a space like this. So, so nothing in the history of American slavery is colloquial. Everything is colloquial and discretionary. Nothing is fixed. So um, a plot could be as big as this, smaller, way bigger. Um, those plots that Eve talked about could be by a creek. They could be in the woods. They could be right by the cabin. So there's no. So there's not one space. And also the elders... Um, now, when we talk about elders at that time, we're really talking about people between their 50s and 70s and probably not much older. If you were older than that, that was an, especially black and enslaved and had worked many years, did physical labor. You were lucky if you were not blind or deaf or disabled um, or in some cases maimed. Um, so for those elders who were still able bodied, who were past their years in a tobacco field, working in the garden, helping preserve the family garden was very important, and they could devote some hours to that. Um, in the same way that the children or, or enslaved people who might have been um, disabled themselves, we don't think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there were yeah. enslaved people who couldn't yeah. hear, who couldn't see, who were, slight, who were sight impaired, or who were physically unable to walk very far or do much physical labor, who may have had back issues, etc. So all of that's really important to take into consideration. I remember e, there was one uh, WPA narrative that talked about, it was a woman, she talked about how her father was really strict about her helping him in the garden and her job was to hold the lantern. You oh. know, like pine knots? I do. Wow. Lantern. Yeah. And so she was, she would kind of be like a kid, you know, she's like, I don't want to. And he was like, you got to know, you got to pay attention, you got to hold that light steady so that I can plant, I have no other time to do this work. Yeah. And so she learned it was a really important job yeah. to maintain in gardens. But you're talking about a peck of corn. You're talking about, that's two, two dry gallons of corn. You're talking about a few herring. You're talking about a little bit of salt pork. That is not enough to live on. That is, the, in fact, you, the expectation was is that you would somehow figure out the foraging, the gardening, and other things to provide for yourself and your table. Yeah. So it's really... Um, 
these gardens were lifesavers in so many ways. And of course, there are things in the garden that are in other parts of this space. For example, across the way there's turnip greens and there's onions and there'll be collards in another space. These were also critically important vegetables. It just so happens in here, we're really focusing on those warmer weather vegetables that take up a little bit more space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, tell me about the the hill. So, we have our. Oh, I think we have a, a big drone going over. <laughs> so over here we have, in our indigenous garden, we have hills. We have hills here, and we also have in our colonial garden we have hills. So, three different three different groups of people, and they're usually something very similar. Would you like to tell us sure. really the little bit more about that? So, I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, uh, Mr. Robert, when you were growing up, um, um, King Queen County. Yes, indeed. When you when you did sweet potatoes, did you do any sort of hills or mounding? Yeah, we did mostly hills. So even like like our generation is not that far apart. So like right down to my parents' generation, your generation, yeah. you still had people doing that same method that's right and you may not see that in a in a big commercial field but that was still how many southerners did so you know european peasants african farmers indigenous farmers had very similar means of production and technology between them it really wasn't as far apart as people make you think they were yeah, yeah. They, they had to deal with the same elements they had to deal with the same the same kind of pressures and of course you know space and land access is always an important issue. That determines who has the power. Mm. It still yeah. does. Yeah. So just having those, so for native people, there was a whole spiritual science behind the hill and the three sisters. And a lot of kids know about that folklore, but the three sisters was not done the same depending upon what ge place in American geography you were. So for example, the Mandan and the Powhatan may have all both done three sisters, but it was slightly different. Mm. The idea being that the, there's the corn, the mother corn, there is the squash that is low, and there's the beans that go grow up. Similar to the sorghum, the black eyed peas or cow peas, and the melon, but also English system where you have t turnips and other tubers and the things that are going to be planted in certain ways to maximize space and nutrients in the soil. Um, and also it just looks a certain way. Yeah. It, 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 there's a certain appearance, and we, can, we can't even imagine. So, right, Mr. Robert, like the whole, a whole field of tobacco grown in hills. That's right. Different experience than just something growing in a row. You got it. And just like Michael is saying, when he's talking about a hill, we're talking a huge amount of dirt where someone is taking a tool like a grub hoe or a garden hoe, and you are starting out a little bit wide, right? and you are moving around that plant to bring all that dirt up around it just like this and that's how you form a hill that's going to hold more moisture right. and give any plant a lot of support So if you can imagine, like, what was that from a uh, landing car? Like ten thousand hills. That's right. To, I mean, I mean, think That's about right. uh, what, to, uh, like, a person having to make thousands of hills in a week. That's right. I, it boggles the mind. So it's not just like, hey, I'm gonna, I guess I'll plant something. It'll be easy and simple. <laughs> yeah. And fun. No, it's like imagine making thousands of those. I think that someone, I don't know who did the who did the research on it. But I think someone got it down to like, you had to do each one of those within a two and a half minute period. Oh, uh, wow. And to a to a one acre tobacco, how many? How that's that's, that's yeah, thousands of hills. About a thousand of hills to an acre. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. Really working. Yep. So, just keeping that in mind. Again, if there's any questions, ask them. Have let's have dialogue. But we're happy to have this conversation because this is for us very um, very important work. I had several questions come in. Um, one is from Natalie, and it, it was asking if this site we're on across from the church was actually the site of an original garden. Maybe you could speak to that, and then if there are, because you can answer that quickly, but are there any known spots around town where, where there was an enslaved person's garden? Are there any that we can document here in Williamsburg? 
Um, and so, still say, you know, that's the spot. Yeah. Okay. So this is this was uh, John Custis the Fourth's property in the 18th century. Uh, of course, his property ended at the Duke of Gloucester Street. There was a tenement house there that burnt in the end of the 18th century, famous for the Peter Scott shop. Uh, he was a cabinet maker. This uh, house on the other side is another tenement house and kitchen. And this all would have been cleared off all the way over to the other hill, which is uh, where his house was. And he had that cleared because this was his vista. And uh, he most likely had a garden very similar to this but uh, where you're growing a more luxury vegetable. So um, an artichoke, it took me one year to grow three little artichokes. Um, so it's not food that's gonna sustain you, but Custis owns three plantations. So that is more than likely where his food is coming from. So we're uh, doing archeology span in the Custis site. We're trying to find where maybe his enslaved either had a had a building or at some sort of a place living quarters or did they live in his house so here in town we do know that the enslaved are living in the houses um, maybe a spare room i think brush everard house there's a, a room upstairs they're sleeping uh, in the kitchens upstairs of the kitchens in hallways um, and as for gardens of the enslaved probably archaeology so we've mentioned um, Rich Neck Plantation, uh, also Carter's Grove. Utopia. There's, Utopia. yeah, yeah, um, and then also, oh gosh, uh, Kings Mill. Mm -hmm. So we know there are there were uh, enslaved quarters, and there's g really good um, reports because they talk about the foods that they find there. So. Uh, my whole reason for wanting to grow a peanut here is rich neck. They find a peanut. They also find some other seeds. So uh, that's kind of the green light for me to want to plant these kind of things. We know they're here. And also what I need people to understand is that there is no George Washington slip here for black people. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's not a thing. It's, it, and, and I mean that with, with, with all due candor because let's face it. Well, where, where have most of our cabins gone? Well, most people didn't think of a cabin or something worth preserving. They just said, okay, where's the nails? They burn it down. Or they take the lumber somewhere else, re repurpose it. That was anybody's house. Yeah. You know, if it was an old house, eh, it's old. It's yeah. not fashionable anymore. Let's take those nails. Let's take that lumber. So that's one element that I think folks really need to get is that there wasn't this sense of historic preservation because, because things had been the same for so long. There wasn't any. There was. There was no sense of nostalgia. Number two, for those people who were under the lion's paw, yeah, they really didn't have the the luxury of preserving their spaces. And to to you know to answer that question, how do we know about those that what remained there? Because an archaeological study was done, and then it was paved over. Ah. Uh. Then it became a golf course or an apartment complex or a subdivision or a subdivision. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, I mean, even I think even some of the areas around here, um, you know, I didn't realize until very recently. Oh, this parking lot used to be part of the enslaved quarter because they said they did the archaeological study here. It's like, OK, so the recreation of these spaces is, is so important because if we don't do that for the future generations, they won't know why these spaces were important. Yes. Yeah. You're telling the truth, Michael. It, it disappears. It disappears. People disappear. People disappear. And also, these are people who don't have the, you know, the access to, to write their own story and to preserve it that way. So that's the reason why when we do this work, it's part of the research is looking at Africa and the Caribbean. Part of the research is looking at rural black communities that still exist today in across the South. Part of the research is archaeology. Part of the research is ethnobotany. Part of the research is herbalism. Part of the research is um, going and looking at the WPA narratives that left by the last generation that were enslaved in this country, and also the, the, the um, emancipatory narratives of black people who were escaping slavery, like Frederick Douglass or Harriet Jacobs. Yeah. So that we, so that we, if you put all those pieces together, and also the elder wisdom, you know, both um, Mr. Robert and I grew up with different levels and in, in periods of people telling us what they experienced. We have family in, in places in the rural South, so to us, when you hear certain things, see certain things, you go, 
Oh, my grandmother told me that. Right. Oh, my father taught me that. Yes. So all of those pieces of evidence come together to form what we know about these spaces. So um, unless we have another question, we were having a discussion before we started today, and we were talking about like power objects and things that would have been or planted around the garden to guard it. Uh -huh. Can you? I would love you to talk about that. And you know, honestly, <laughs> so you know, it's one thing to just plant all these plants. It's another thing to experience the culture and talk about the people who plant it and the reasons. So I think uh, this is a fabulous story. So what, so what are the things, yeah, our hats are going to fly in a second. I know. <laughs> but um, one of the things that it's, it's very important to understand that a lot of these garden spaces were not just practical. They were also spiritual. Yeah. And there were places where you could um, tuck away parts of your culture that would be otherwise might be suspect to scrutiny. And that scrutiny was what went all the way from, huh, I'd like to do that, to uh, that's weird and odd and primitive and I don't like that, but go ahead, to I don't want you doing that because that's not Christian, that's not European. And so you had to kind of like figure out and strategize how you were going to keep those parts of your culture alive. But another aspect is that in West Central Africa, most of Sub-Saharan Africa period, you know, a lot of these things are not for public discussion. There are secret societies, yeah. and there are things that there's all there's secret languages only men speak to each other, and secret languages only women speak to each other, and children make you know even even things like for example even today if you were to go to Oakland and other spaces different African American varieties of Pig Latin uh. that are spoken, so to the point where they had to hire a a a, a dialect and language li linguistic expert, those things still persist in our culture, and they're they sometimes they're they're people poke fun but they're actually very serious because what if somebody was trying to get away from enslavement yeah seek their freedom what if somebody was running off to lord dunmore's army what if somebody wanted to do so, do something else i mean there were all these little things kind of like kind of like the navajo code talkers yes that kind of thing yeah and the other element is that you know when you have these gardens you would put up so if you have a bead that i brought uh, one of the many beads i brought up from from west africa oh, somehow you. some way it's going to work its way into this garden and with, among other things, there'll be different power objects that will be hung from these poles. You know, there'll be crystals, there'll be beads, little, little small, subtle <laughs> things that you have to really look for. But the purpose is to keep thieves out of your garden. The purpose is to keep animals that may destroy your garden away. The purpose, and some of them have linguistic puns associated with them. So it's a very intricate system of um, using that sort of like projecting, you know, that's the African-American version of the secret. If I think it's so and I will it to be this way, hmm. this is the way it's going to be. But, you know, you think about that. It, it's a form of control. When you don't have a lot of control in your life and of, over your circumstances, you're going to use everything. Europeans are the same thing. They're going to, whatever the prayers they say, whatever folklore they use, salt behind the back, all that stuff. Right. Every, every group has this because the world back then is especially chaotic. Yes. And That's people nice. feel people feel um, anytime there's a natural disaster or there's an illness. See, we can explain some of those things or at least do uh, disaster management. They couldn't. So for them, those power, we say power objects instead of charm or amulet because sometimes people say charm or, or superstition. It belittles the culture. Mm. And I don't want to, and particularly because a lot of these things come from the culture of women. I really don't want to belittle them because women's culture is so often the first thing to be thrown out, belittled, and, and disregarded, you know. But if you're the ones having the babies, and you don't want to die in childbirth, and there's a high, there's a high possibility that you might that might happen to you, or you don't want to burn the food, and if that's the only food you have, and you have nothing else to eat, then you take that that old religion very seriously, because it's the only thing that's going to give you psychological peace as you go about your daily life. Huh. Oh. That's powerful, Mike. I, I I understand what you're saying. Uh, just as this man is talking about the culture, the people, the history, just like y'all saw me here putting those plants in the ground, all this takes work, real work that you have to commit to, not because you want to. You do this kinds of things because you love it, because it's fulfilling, and it connects with your history. And uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, it is incredible. I hope all of y'all 
will plant a garden so you'll know how this feels. It'll connect you with your past. It'll connect you with your people and your history. Amen. I shake. We have a question from Edith. And as you talk about, I mean, the many, many challenges with, with studying a topic like this, Edith was curious about what the, the role of archaeology in understanding Afro-African uh, Virginian foodways. Because I'm sure some, some of our watchers aren't completely familiar with what archaeologists can teach us about this, or they used to find in metal objects in the ground. So uh, I'll, I'll start. And um, so when I was looking, uh, someone two and a half years ago asked me, they were going to do ground penetrating radar. They were looking for the enslaved garden uh, at their site. And they're like, well, what do you think I'm going to find? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. What are you going to find? <laughs> so, so there began my, my little travel uh, of education and libraries and found out that it's a little bit here, a little bit there. But um, anyway, so it's, I went to the archaeology because archaeologists deal in what is absolutely there. So mm -hmm. if I start yeah. there, I know if they find seeds, that tell me, tells me the plants, uh, it tells me who is living there. So at Rich Neck, when you find the sunflower seeds, mm -hmm. the master of the house is not eating those sunflowers. His enslaved people are. So it tells me who could, uh, who could live, you know, who lived there. Um, it's fleeting, usually bottoms of wells. Wells are filled in when they uh, either run dry or collapse. So it's a trash pit. A lot of times those trash pits are very lucrative for finding out all kinds of things about the household. You're only going to find, and you're only going to find so many things. So, for example, it's very difficult to find the remains of, of, of seeds or stuff from a tomato. Yeah. Or even a tuber. So they have found sweet potatoes, have found persimmon, have found apple and cherry and plum and pecan and walnut and hickory nut. And, and and things things that we like straw and bed grass seed. You're like, well, could that could have just been anything? No, those were healing um, things. Like if poplar forest did a lot of archaeology, but the soil can't tell you everything. Right. There's yeah. a lot of. But for example, you're not going to find any remains of collard greens, turnip greens, mustard, or any of that stuff, which yeah. is critical yep. to the diet. Leafy greens were absolutely yep. part of the diet. So if you totally go by only what you can find in the soil and don't look at the oral history yes. or contextual history, right. That's difficult, but yes, when it comes to um, um, archaeobotany, it's a very strict thing. Yeah. Also, it's like you would think you would think that there was more meat than vegetable. By the way, that some the of the archaeologists scrutinize the bones. You know, them yeah. pig bones, yeah. a lot of deer yeah. bones, yeah. Or, you know, the chicken bones. Right. But we all know that that was the some tommy food. Right. It's just that those bones were used over and over again for flavor. They were used in um, power objects. They were used to also Love ones like here. You see the oyster shell. People would throw bones, oyster shell, their what call, the trash in the garden. When, when, when trash to them was not the same. It was biodegradable things, pieces of high leather. In fact, one of the more unfortunate descriptions of a lot of these enslaved gardens was, "Oh, this is messy. These, these trashy, awful people." But if you were walking across somebody's garden day like that, you'd be like, "Oh, they're permaculture experts. <laughs> they're organic. They're you know hands on. Yes, they're yes. whole. They they eat." The whole animal aren't they great but these were just poor people who knew how to survive they knew how to survive and they had been doing it for thousands of years i mean it's just it's just, it's, it, it's remarkable how a lot of those survival methods we all we've, we've all been to a store where they say oh the food is handcrafted i hope so <laughs> oh the food is organic you didn't put no poison on it i hope so oh my god you used the whole animal instead of making the poor animal suffer you could break one part off and i hope so mm. I hear you, but buddy. our ancestors did this yeah. our four forefathers and forefathers did this but it's important that it come back and be shown and people can see it and they see the kind of plants we're growing and how yes. it's grown. You know, you don't need a huge plot of ground. You can work it with a shovel or a spade with a hoe. Um, it can. And none of this, would, and, I mean, again, you see these patches here. So where Mr. Robert is, all of this is going to somehow be fed in with a little bit more something. And, you know, people may wonder, well, how do you do that without killing the plants? You just walk careful. Yeah. You're just really careful. And you also yeah. kind of get a feeling for where things are. And then you always leave enough room for the width of your foot. 
yeah. so that you can, you know, scuttle through the garden. That's a big thing. Yeah. Mr. Robert, when you were when you were growing up, I just want to ask the question for the benefit of everybody. Yeah. Um, like, what do you remember people growing in around your community in their gardens? What, what kind of plants? String beans, potatoes, turnips, squash, corn, uh, watermelons, cantaloupes, cabbage, um, lots of greens turnip greens, collard greens, kale greens, right? Um, lots of greens. But uh, we grew so much food that even in my day, we had plenty not only just for ourselves, but we had plenty for families beside us, and other families grew the same food, so everybody shared. Right. Um, that's how it was when we were growing up. So just the, uh, also is the value. So that's it's it. generosity, hospitality. Yep. Making sure that those that didn't have had. That's right. And also, I would assume if, if you needed something and a neighbor needed something, you might be able to say, hey, I'll give you a heap of these squash or a little bit of sweet potatoes. And they, that might give you a couple of eggs That's or right. chicken or something else. Or that might, or might even be something more substantial. You calling it, Michael. Depending upon what you have. And the, all these practices, everything, every, almost every food you mentioned could have been grown in an African Virginian garden at some point between the six, the 17th and 19th centuries and beyond, but also to so the same practices of barter and exchange. These gardens were important financially and economically because remember Jefferson, Jefferson's not the only one, but he's the primary example of, I'm keeping this record book of all these things I'm, you know, exchanging food and other items for eggs, chickens, fish, honey, um, Washington's talking about how like he would get um, honey from the wood carvers and I was talking to um, what's our friend up there oh my gosh I can't Pat I think her name was Pat right Pat Brodowski not Pat Brodowski mm -hmm. our friend at Mount Vernon oh. Mary Mary yeah. and she was telling me oh, the, the, the honey comes from the carpenters and I was like huh so I did, I did my homework and so uh, when I was in West Africa in Sierra Leone in Senegal they said oh yeah the people who gather the, the other the wild honey are the wood carvers because they're the ones who chop down the trees that have yeah. the hives in them, yeah. and they know how to smoke them out, and they then they're, they they think they're part of their trade, and wow. so it's like those little moments of wow. But of course, in Williamsburg, there was a ton of commerce done yes. underground and above ground, using produce, using poultry, using eggs, using fish, honey, foraged fruit, um, and these gar that's what these gardens were important for, for that purpose as well. Don't get me preaching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so, all right, so some of the plants we have in here, is, uh, we have a lot of peppers. <clears throat> so the uh, Scotch bonnet, fish pepper, long cayenne. Malagueta. Uh, Malagueta pepper, <laughs> yes, which I am really, really looking forward to. Let's see. Um, I think we put in some bullnose and sheep's nose peppers as mm -hmm. well. So the bull nose, you'll all recognize that's more of a green pepper that you're buying in your grocery store today, the big uh, stuffing pepper. And the sheep's nose is a pimento pepper. Um, the names are cute. Sheep's nose, bull nose. Well, if you, if you yeah. look at them and then you know. go look at the animal, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> so we're growing, a, uh, our bean is a case knife bean. Uh, these are, we are going to have... Um, the basil that you brought, uh, uh, Eritrean, right? Yeah, Eritrean so it's an African variety of basil, yeah. So we're going to have that. Our plants just came up. We kind of got off to a little bit of a late start this spring. Um, so uh, hopefully next year we'll be, be able to jump on a bandwagon but this a is, sooner. But this is like not that long ago. Look how like verdant oh, yeah, and beautiful yeah, and productive. Yeah. Yeah. It is, so that's cool. You know, when you're here every day, it grows slowly. It does slowly, and then you go, oh, wow, look at that. So the basil, for example, was planted um, for medicinal purposes, but also this is, they call it scent leaf, or pot manger in West Africa. Um, and in, Chow, in Igbo, one of the languages that would have been very prominently spoken in one generation in this part of Virginia, because 60% of the enslaved coming into Yorktown um, were from Nigeria, what was now Nigeria and Cameroon, and and adjacent regions. So 
what's now called Bamenda in Cameroon and Cross River and the Igbo land in Nigeria. So if you, it's, that's a really tight area. It's probably no bigger than, if I could give an equivalent, probably no bigger than um, the limits of Tidewater, Virginia, spread out. Oh, wow. And then to have 60%. So, so how does that work? It means that so many of these elements of the culture would have arrived here and people would have had a common understanding. So Anshanwu is also there for uh, protection, good luck, but it's not just the Igbo. It's the, Ma, it's the Min, Mandinka and Wolof in Senegal. It's people in Congo. I was like amazed this plant was found everywhere. Everybody grew up by the garden, edge of the garden, and by the wall. And so my grandmother, my Virginia grandmother, who was born in 1912, and my Alabama gr grandmother born in 1925, both said, oh, yeah, you plant basil by your front door to keep evil out your house. Huh. So... I'm like, okay, evil at the house, great. And so when I went to Nigeria, everybody, you know, you, pla you pass these big, tall basil plants, indigenous basil plants, and people will just rub it all over. Hmm. I'm like, huh, okay, that's interesting. Because it smells good, but what's really going on? They keep off mosquitoes. Oh. And oh. bugs and cockroaches, other things like that. So okay. part of the reason having them around your house and in your house and on your body is to protect yourself in your house. But in Ghana, Mr. Robert, they call basil, the, th the word is, the, the, the nickname is, the thing that makes the chicken dance. Wow. Which is like when, they, when you make like the chicken soup and chicken dishes, you wow. put a little bit of that in there oh. and it makes it dance in your stomach. I like it. Because it makes it taste better. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. So there's a lot to learn. There's a lot. I mean, you think about the number of cultures that were brought here, the cultures that came into contact with Scotch, Irish, English, German, French, Spanish, the, in, the many indigenous cultures. And just the layers of meaning that, we, that we've lost, but also accrued yeah, yeah. over time. It's pretty fascinating. I think probably the only thing that has not come up, come up in the garden is the uh, sesame. Yeah, so sesame wasn't, the, wasn't happy. Yeah. It was so old seed. We'll, we'll work harder on that next time. Yep. <laughs> A couple of fairly practical questions from, from folks watching along. Um, one is from Guinevere, who was curious about where enslaved people would get their seeds or cuttings from. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do we answer that one? Uh, yeah, so uh, so I know uh, I know one one source that's really interesting. So the reason why the pigeon pea is here is John Cussus IV, who we mentioned earlier, is actually growing the pigeon pea and shipping it down to the islands to feed the enslaved people. So um, that's my that's my only reference. So okay. so peanut. So if you're being fed peanuts on the ship from Africa to they're gonna, here, yep, they're going to bring those things over. People need to understand that enslaved Africans were not tended. Yeah. They the, their their human status ended where their where their certain where their personal liberties and rights ended but their status as 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 human beings who could do their own thing and, and should provide for themselves began with sustenance you know shelter the basic the four basic needs right. so when they brought over those peanuts on the ship or other thing like okra okra was often dried okay because we're talking about the wet season and dry season yes okra would be dried in the pot or sliced and so you had you had it you were able to get to those seeds and so remember, there's already enslavement entrenched in the islands in Brazil yes. long before anybody knows what Virginia is. So some of those plants are bouncing from place to place. Because remember, they were enslaved people from Barbados and Jamaica mm -hmm. and Haiti and other places who would then become the, the roots of the enslaved population in the Carolinas or the Chesapeake or Louisiana or even New York. So they're going to bring things with them that have come across the way that have been settled. Or sometimes they just bring stuff... We really have a strong case for the peanut going from South America to Angola, which, by the way, is a three-week trip. Wow. 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 And then bouncing from Angola and other places back to the American South, you know. So we had there's some, well, someone told me one time, said, um, I was having a conversation with William Boys Weaver and Tom Burford and some other luminaries in terms of heirloom plants. And one of the most exciting things that was said was, it wasn't just, it was the pirates. And yes, they were black pirates too. And it was missionaries, like Moravian missionaries. And it was people who were just going on these trips for fun. If you can even think of it that way. Yeah. And just people doing, collecting, someone might say, hey, 
Eve, look at this cute, this, this cool plant I have. Yeah. Then you go, oh, look at this plant. And then you put it in the garden. Yeah. Everybody goes, look at Eve's amazing plant. <laughs> and then somebody's going to do this one day. With that seed pod. <laughs> right. When Eve's not and looking. And then when Eve's not looking, the neighbor to neighbor to neighbor to neighbor. And spreads. It will spread. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes, so it's, it's, it's interesting. The one thing I want to dispel, though, and I have to do this, is the thing about the seeds in the hair. Nah, oh, right. thank you. It didn't happen yeah. that way. And it's a lovely story. But what's, what's more powerful is not that it could have happened. So we know that, the, for example, the Maroons, people who are running away from slavery and establishing communities outside of plantations in South America, look what happens. They go, they would do things like when they were about to be a raid on their settlement. Yes, they would actually do the, the rice grains in the cornrows. Oh, wow. But not on the ship. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that simply yeah. wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And the best version I've heard so far made me just go, Lord, we got to teach some folks. If somebody <laughs> said, listen to this. Well, you, you ain't ready for this one. Okay. You ain't ready for this one. They put the rice grains in the hair so they would have something to eat on the way over. Three months, you they, eat seven oh, rice wow. grains. And, and they knew they were taking a trip, too, with, right? With they the had time to pack. <laughs> yes, they had time to... Yep. I mean, no, that's not how right. it worked. Right. But, it's, but, it's, but then again, that's why this work is so important. Yes, my Yeah. Point corrective yep. history that acknowledges yes that lore has its has its means and its importance but i think the most most important thing about all of that is this everybody in the every black community in the new world had that story but it was metaphorical yes it was no more accurate than steal away to jesus mm-hmm. so the way jesus meant i'm out i'm going to cincinnati m- m- toronto montreal maybe alaska anywhere but here sure right sure I have the seeds we carried in our hair is what? Ideas in your head. Hmm. Your only luggage was your brain. Huh. Yeah. So that's that. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, moving on maybe just for a moment into the kitchen. Doug was wondering about, we've talked a bunch about sweet potato greens. How, how would you prepare them? Any, any suggestions? So you cut them very thin. You wash them good, really good because they're next to the dirt. And um, you want to be cooking greens, not growing greens. Um, you there slice you, them, very, right? There you, you, you slice them very thin. And then you, like I said, any allium that you want, if you can do alliums, like onions, garlic, shallots. Um, they're great with tomatoes. Mm. And so they call it in, in uh, Monday land, potato leaf stew. Or plasas. They call it creole plasas with rice. So plasas is any green that you kind of put into, I don't know, like a little sauce or something. Mm-hmm. You can even do greens and peanuts. Right. I bet that's good. Right? Yeah. And then you put it over rice and whatever protein you want to use or no protein at all, animal protein that is, and you're good. You have to cook that for me. All right. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to hook you up. Both of you. Miss Robin knows my cooking is good. Yes, indeed. So that's the thing. No problem. We're getting close to the end of our time here. Everybody watching along. uh, Before we ask the last question, um, you can check out our schedule of Juneteenth programs posted in, in the comments. And always check back with Colonial Williamsburg. We are committed telling, to telling the whole story of all the people here in Colonial America. Uh, but maybe to, as a final question today, and you've touched on this throughout the program, but maybe each of you could, in sort of a nutshell, tell us why this Sankofa Heritage Garden is so important. Mr. Robert, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, if we are going to be honest about history we got to have all of the gardens all of the stories all of the food how it was planted who grew it how they grew it um, how it brought people together and I think that's that's one of the most important things how this food kept family I mean strong worth living and hoping and this is just a start y'all come back come back and see this garden how i've cleaned it out the food is going to grow and the weeds are going to be covered over by the food oh my gosh (laughs) (laughs) candid camera yeah so i i am hoping that we will continue these gardens on so that we can remember people who work the soil um foods that they grew foods that are now part of uh our food ways so when you have all these houses and the cooks in the 18th century are enslaved women that's brought a really rich variety to our diets and i'm yes, hoping indeed. this kind of a thing we can 
remember where that food came from and who helped enrich us. So for for the anchor, the positive and uh, truthful words that have been spoken, I think it's important for people to understand that we we are we've always been a multicultural society. Even when it was only native people, still a multicultural society. Different visions, different spirits, different identities, different perspectives, and even more so today. And I think that when we experience each other's food and look at each other's gardens we start to make comments based on our culture and have a dialogue and exchange. In a multicultural society, democracy, 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 it's so critical that we have respect for each other's culture, understand each other's boundaries, and can appreciate the fact that we are blessed to be happily contaminated with each other's worldviews and aesthetics and perspectives. And this garden, the importance of it is that people can come here and see the beginnings of another part of American history, an ancient part of American history that started in uh, West Africa, 70,000 year old human civilization. So when we talk about the cultures that we come from, they're not, they're not last week, they're not Ellis Island, they're not, they're not the turn of the century, they're going back thousands of years. That corn over there is from Teosinte, that's over 11,000 years ago. That's not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not Taco Bell, you know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not two seconds ago. It's thousands of years ago. When you talk about, you know, going to eat East Asian food, look at that. 9,000, 10,000 years. This is 70,000 years, and multiple cultures are in this garden, happily growing together. And so that's what I want people to do. I want them to be responsible citizens who can appreciate each other, acknowledge the, the contributions of their ancestors, and be in harmony like these plants are. Yeah. Well, Eve. Robert and Michael, thank you all for your vision with this garden, your commitment to it, and the generosity in, in sharing this with us today. Thank um, you. To all of you out there, we have to, to thank you for joining us and also thank all of our donors for making programs like this possible. Um, to learn how you can support Colonial Williamsburg, visit us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Um, as we sign off today, Michael, could, could you let everyone know what you'll be doing with us throughout the rest of this week. Sure, of I am yours for a week. <laughs> um, not uncommon with me and CW. Um, because it's Juneteenth week, which I now call it the second Black History Month, only it's a week. Um, I'll be doing a number of different programs. I'll be cooking at the Palace, probably at the Armory. Um, I'll be, tomorrow I'll be cooking at the Palace. Um, I'll also be doing another live stream, an event we're doing at the um, Hennage having a dialogue about what Juneteenth means in the context of the history discussed here. There'll be some feasting through hospitality down the road onto Gloucester. So I'll be uh, a, a menu that I help curate. So I'll be, you know, hosting that and telling people about the history of the food and just sitting down and talking and yapping and eating and drinking, which is my favorite thing anyway. So, um, yeah, we got a lot of stuff going on this week and beyond. And I hope that you'll join us here for this. This is one of my favorite places in the world. And um, it's a, it's a, honor and a privilege to um, bring my ancestors and our ancestors' history to life and give it the honor and respect it deserves. So come join us.